on our panel tonight, I can confirm that we have two Aries, one Pisces <laughs> and one Taurus. <laughs> there might also be one Tory and they might overlap, but you've got to work that out. We also have, I'm told, a debate. Uh, save our private schools. VAT should not be charged on private school fees. So I have been asked just to indicate uh, what our panel thinks and where they were at school. So Ash, where were you at school? Comprehensive, baby. Uh, Enfield County, which is in North London. Good experience? Yeah, I loved it. Melissa? Started out in private school and then was taken out with my three brothers at the age of eight and we were all sent to the local primary and the local secondary. Good experience? Look, adolescence is a mixed experience, but <laughs> I, I, love, I love my school and as much as you're ever going to love all those teenage years. Helen? Um, I went to a comprehensive in the north and I'm the first in my family to go to university. And good experience? Broadly. And there was no social media, which helps. And Fraser and Nelson? I went to a comprehensive in the Highlands until my dad got posted to Cyprus. He was with the military, so I got sent at the government's expense to boarding school for five years. Good experience? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Should we end the debate I, I, there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's interesting, this whole debate, it's very timely. We have had, in our history, 31 years of Labour governments. We have had uh, 19 years in which uh, Labour had a good working majority, and 10 of those were under just one Prime Minister, Tony Blair. And throughout Labour's history, in 1924, 1925, 1965, 1974, and uh, 19, uh, 97, uh, and now again in 2024, Labour has made strong noises about wanting to get rid of independent schools. But once in power, they've done very little about it. But now we have a very firm pledge, and the pledge is what we're going to be basing the discussion on, which is about VAT. And we know that Keir Starmer is not going to budge from that. I'd like to have... <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> well, um, so I'm going to uh, ask you to do a pre-vote uh, to get a sense of where your opinions lie. And I'm going to be announcing that, not now, but a bit later. And this is specifically, you're voting on the second part of the motion, namely... VAT should not be charged on private school fees. And uh, if you haven't already done so, please can you hold up your phones and scan the QR code, which you'll see on the screen behind me, or use the link you received before the event, and please vote for the motion or against the motion. And if you're unsure, vote undecided. And if you're watching on the live stream, click the polls button to vote will announce the pre-vote results after we've heard the opening speeches. So, we're now on to the opening speeches. And um, I'm going to ask the first speaker, and he's going to speak in favour of the motion. The motion I'm going to repeat again, I'm going to be repeating it a lot tonight. VAT should not be charged on private school fees. And this is Fraser Nelson, editor of The Spectator, since 2009, also a columnist at the Daily Telegraph, and he sits on the board of the Centre for Social Justice, out of whose work some of his ideas will be formed and shaped tonight. I'm going to have a clock here, my phone, and whatever Jonathan Haidt thinks about them, they are very good timekeepers, and after nine minutes, I'm going to ping. So don't take it personally. Um, and I'm going to keep pinging. So, Fraser Nelson. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I'd like to start by, I wouldn't quite say correcting you, Sir Anthony, but I don't think it's quite so that Keir Starmer will definitely not change his mind on this. He's got a reasonable track record of being quite um, flexible, shall we say, on positions that he took earlier on. So I do think today's, this evening's debate will matter. The vote will matter. I think the result will matter. Because we're here to discuss nothing less than the fabric of our society. How to make it fairer and what actually works versus what doesn't. I mean, to stand here and, um, 
and debate in favour of private schools is, in, by many means, probably one of the most unpopular things that you can do. So thank you, Intelligence Squared, for allowing me to take this particular um, position on, in the stocks. Um, but it, it sounds as if you're making a defence of privilege, a defence of inequality, a defence of um, the class structure and stupendous wealth. You will probably have heard um, a sort of set of statistics, which I'd be surprised if none of you have heard, that private schools educate 7% only of pupils, but nonetheless, we generate 65% of senior judges, 60% of permanent secretaries in the civil service, and 52% of all diplomats. So it seems, on the face of these figures, to be a recipe for inequality. If you've got enough money, your kids can go private, you get a fast stream to the top, and this represents what is wrong with Britain. Well, I'd like to cast some doubt on that analysis. Um, I'd like to say that that reflects, not by the way, these senior judges were being educated decades ago, and um, the same with the senior civil servants. What's happening right now is a far more equal, far more cohesive system. There's lots of progress to be made, don't get me wrong, but we're in a situation where state school pupils have never made a greater proportion, not just of who gets into Oxford, Cam Oxford or Cambridge, although I'm amazed at how this has seemed to be the most important metric in British <laughs> educational debate, but they make up a far, but never has there been a greater share of state school kids getting straight A's or A stars in exams, never has the attainment gap been smaller than it is. Something has been going right in the last 15 years, if you genuinely care about narrowing the gap, if you genuinely care about progressive politics, this is something which a trend we want to see encouraged and you want to see more of it happening. So what has actually happened? I'd like to point to two things. Rather than persecute and go after independent schools, they've been multiplied. We now see lots of hundreds of independent schools within the state sector. We've, um, so the so-called academy set up by the Blair government, continued um, by the Conservatives, as a great kind of bipartisan idea here, have, are now working minor miracles right up and down the country. Not so far from here, we've got Catherine Burblesing School, Michaela Community School. There, with a pretty um, challenging intake, they get better results than the average private school. That's not just, uh, it's number one in the whole country for, for um, progressive and attainment. And that's not just her story. There are dozens, scores of private schools, so state schools, now academies, that get better results than the average private school. But there's also something else going on, so um, helping the state schools. And that is the unprecedented amount of collaboration that's now going on between private schools and the state sector. We've had a system right now saying, okay, you can keep your charitable status, you can keep your VAT-free status, but let's see you acting as charities, let's see what you can give back to the communities. We've now got a situation where 80% of private schools have got some kind of partnership with state schools. They can offer thousands of bursaries, they really go out of their way to do outreach. And I've got, some, um, I've got three examples, all of which are reasonably close to here. Latimer Upper School, not so far away, a fifth of their income, a fifth, now goes on bursaries. 450 state school kids go there um, to, on the weekends. There's a STEM academy, a debating school for primaries. Then you've got um, Dulwich College, again, not so far from here. 200 pupils there are getting five million pounds between them in bursaries. Um, kids of a nearby City Heights Academy are invited there for weekends. And we have in Christ Hospital School, again, about an hour um, south of here, where Steve Hilton, Cameron's advisor, went. Um, off the, the number of kids in that school on either negligible or uh, free places or reduced places, 600 out of 900. Now, you might be thinking, am I cherry picking? Of course, these are the best, I would argue. This sort of thing should be expanded a lot more. Now, this is what I personally would do if I was to be uh, Keir Starmer's education secretary, unlikely prospects, but I would be saying to these private schools, look, we've now seen what Latimer, what Christ School, what Dulwich can do. We want all of you guys to be doing a lot more of this. 80% is not high enough. The bursary is not generous enough. There are ways you can do to encourage the partnerships to spread the excellence. So take a situation where Britain has got some of the best schools in the world. The private school sector is undeniably excellent. That's why all of the debates there are, that's why all of this talk about inequality. But you can spread that out more rather 
than force them in on themselves, which is exactly what abolishing VAT would do. It would be saying to them, OK, we, you're done um, operating as charities. We want you now to operate as profit-seeking companies. Now, lots of these schools, we know, will not be able to continue with their VAT. Depending on who you look at, you've got the Independent Institute of Fiscal Studies on one level, Independent Schools Council on another. They say and between 17,000 to 125,000 pupils will be forced out of these schools. Many of them will go bust. But a lot will try not to go bust by cutting down on the costs. No prices for guessing what they're going to be cutting down on. All the bursaries, all the help, all of the things which under the previous charitable model have been working so well will be cut. Now, what sort of parents, by the way, are not going to be able to afford the private schools? We're not talking about the super rich. The super duper rich aren't going to notice 20% on VAT. That's not going to affect them. Who is going to affect your people like, well, an unlikely poster, child for my argument here, Diane Abbott? She sent her son to private school. She says it was the making of him. She had her reasons. And by the way, when we take a talk about a private school, people often imagine, yes, we're eating Harrow, etc. But more than half of private schools have got fewer than 300 pupils. Lots of these are relatively small, catering for kids in various special circumstances. Um, Sir Anthony got us to do the confession there. I went to, my dad was in the military. I went to boarding school. I didn't have really a choice. There are so many people for so many reasons have to go to independent schools. They cater for a whole bunch of people. So making out as if they're finishing school for oligarchs, which is so often the case of a debate, is a far cry from the truth. So you've seen the damage you'll be doing, but all for what? Um, take Keir Starmer's old place, Rygate Grammar, fantastic school. 100 places there are fully funded. It costs 21,000 pounds a year now. 100 places, 100 kids pay nothing. How many kids are going to be paying nothing when their old boy is number 10 imposing VAT? Will that serve to widen access or reduce access to Rygate grammar? No prizes for guessing the answer to that. And this is what comes down to what I think is a fundamental labor principle. Is it progressive? Is it inclusive? Is it going to make society fairer or less fair? Surely that is the only test here. Not how much does it wind up Rishi Sunak? How much does it um, gesture? The question is, is it going to actually help people? And how much will it raise? How much will it raise? Again, let's go back to the Institute for Fiscal Studies. They say about one and a half billion pounds. Now, that's not very much. And that's because, you know, obviously there'll be a cost to the... Right now, I think four and a half billion pounds of school, state school fees aren't being spent by the government because so many private school parents are there. So when you do that working out, about the net effect of the government, the IFS reckons one and a half billion. That would increase a school's budget by two and a half percent. Now, Bridget Phillipson, the Shadow Education Secretary, is, I would suggest, being a touch optimistic when she says that about 2.5% will have a transformational uh, impact on the pupils in state schools. I wish it did, but I'm not quite sure that it will, because one of the strange things about education is that above a certain degree, the money does not translate immediately, even 2.5% results. And I'll tell you something else. Let's look at the top 300 best private schools. Their average pupil leads with three A's and A level, three A's. A good result, not A stars, three A's. But let's look at the best 300 state schools. Their average pupil leaves with A, A, B. Now, there is a difference between these two, but it's not a night and day difference. The average private school fee, 16,000 pounds a year. The average state school kid gets about half that, 8,000. So if 100% um, funding difference isn't going to lead to significant transformational result, then why do we rationally believe that 2.5% is going to? So who is this policy genuinely going to help? If you care about inequality, if you care about making society a more equal place, where's the benefit? It's pretty hard to tell. But where is the hurt going to come from? Who's going to miss out on the opportunities? How many scholarship kids aren't going to get scholarships? How many partnerships are going to be cancelled? It's not very difficult to work out that this is going to lead to a bifurcation of system where the super rich are happy paying their VAT and this creates a bigger distance with the rest. That is not what we want to do. I would like to close with one thought, that the biggest mistake in politics is to judge a policy by its intentions, not its results. So please, this evening, let's judge this policy by its likely results and reject the motion. Thank you.
So, uh, thank you very much indeed, Fraser there. And uh, you have been docked uh, 17 seconds <laughs> because you overshot. Um, that is a thousand pounds a second, um, <laughs> which you're going to pay. In. Now, I want, um, before we go on, before I introduce our next speaker, uh, just to find out what about your own schooling. And uh, Hannah Kay, the brilliant person who's organised tonight, uh, wanted us to do this. If you um, attended uh, an, a private school for all or some of your uh, career, including people up in the balcony, yes, you can vote too. There's nothing that Intelligent Square uh, won't uh, let you do. By the way, look around and just enjoy the sense of being here with human beings. And if you're at home and on your own, uh, look around uh, and, and you could be... Uh, here and, and you could put your hand up and that will be fascinating for everyone uh, watching you on your own. But put your hand up now if at any time you attended a private school. Uh, right hands down. Um, and so I'm glad we did that. Uh, but I, uh, I'm, not, not so, I'm not so certain Melissa who is coming up now. Um, Melissa uh, is going to be our first speaker against the motion. VAT should not be charged on private school fees. Melissa, very well known, also writer, long term, but not a veteran campaigner for a high quality comprehensive school <laughs> system. Uh, she's a former chair of Comprehensive Future and a founder member of the Private Education Policy Forum. Her many books are uh, include books on education, School Wars, The Battle for Britain's Education, and Life Lessons, The Case for a National Education Service. Melissa. Right, thank you. Uh, OK, there are many reasons to feel a little bit sorry for me. One, I, it's not great following Fraser Nelson, and I'll explain why. Two, I'm the Pisces on the panel. And third, the vote that we've just taken. So, look, I want to make three points, and I'm going to go a little bit wider than the VAT issue. I would argue that the Labour plan, which is an unusual act of boldness on Keir Starmer's part, and I think he won't go back on it, and that may be unusual. I think it is a small but a just and a rational move in the right direction. Those of us who have looked at private schools and looked at the whole landscape for a long time have long felt uneasy about two related issues. There's the privilege of private schools, and I absolutely accept that there are different kinds of private school, but mainly about the charitable nature of private schools, which has allowed them to get very, very favourable tax breaks. Now, most of you will know private schools were set up on the basis of a mission to provide education to poor and needy scholars. That is not the purpose or the rationale of the sector today. And it educates and confers enormous lifelong advantages on the children of the relatively affluent and the affluent. And I think Fraser really underplays those advantages. I mean, if you look at what people say about networks at university or networks in work, having gone to a private school puts you in a particular world that leads to you earning £200,000 on average more than somebody who's got the same educational qualifications over the course of a lifetime. And it just puts you in a different, um, a kind of different world. Now, I, Fraser, as I thought he would, went on a great deal about bursaries and scholarships and partnerships. He mentioned particular schools, and he did cherry-pick particular schools. Christ's Hospital is a very, very unusual school. It probably has the highest number of free places in the country. On the whole, if we look at the figures across, only 1% of children in private schools, young people, receive 100% Bursary. A lot of financial help is offered, and I heard a private school head saying this, as a kind of incentive to the relatively well-off. A lot of financial help is offered to them. So, for instance, I looked at the website of one of London's most famous 
private schools yesterday, and that boldly advertises the fact that families with an income of only 126,000 per year or only net assets of 1.4 million may be eligible for a bursary. <laughs> Anthony, I'll give, you the, uh, I'll give you the web link afterwards. So we also hear a lot about partnerships, and the um, Independent Schools Council makes a huge amount of play about partnerships, but I am sceptical. I'm sceptical as a state school parent who saw how partnerships worked on the ground. I'm afraid a lot of them had the flavour of charity in the Victorian sense, which felt at worst insulting, at best patronising to those in state schools. But a detailed 223 study by Manchester University and the Private Education Policy Forum found that most of those partnerships are superficial and they're not properly evaluated in terms of their impact. Very often, they only involve one-off events, such as state school pupils being able to go to see a Wizard of Oz production by a private school, or... Um, joint football matches or joint choir singing and so on. And I don't think it's quite the marvellous move and merger of two sectors that um, Fraser, you know, put well, but wrongly in my view. Now, the most common... Oh, he, he, he's very good. Now, the most common <laughs> argument against the fee hike is that it hits ordinary aspirational families. The coverage of this has just gone on and on about it. We are not all eating the familiar cry. Totally recognise that. But no one who pays for private education counts as average or ordinary in a fiscal sense. Not when the average UK household income is around 32,000, and if the lowest of private school fees is 15,000, you can do the maths. You can't send one child, let alone two or three, on an average income. The truth is, and we know it, most private school parents are in the top 10%, many in the top 1%, and those on lower incomes are often drawing on family wealth, whether it's housing capital or grandparents' um, or grandparents' wealth. Now, I think it's worth pointing out that Labour has made exceptions to the plan. Any child on an educational health or care plan is exempt. And also worth pointing out, the IFS, so useful in this debate, private school fees have risen in real terms 55% since 2003, and I don't think a single child has had to move over to the state sector where, as a result of that real-term rise. So schools and families seem to be able to cope. And watching a recent legal webinar on the question of that mitigation for schools and parents, I suspect they will cope this time as well. Fraser said the money's not much. 1.5 billion, 2% of the school budget, that's not nothing either. 6,500 new teachers in the state sector, an increase in mental health services, and also professional development for teachers. It all helps, particularly as the funding gap between private and state has nearly doubled since 2010. Now, I just want to turn to the question of the terror that some parents seem to have about the state sector. Yes, class sizes are going to be bigger. Yes, there won't be so many extracurricular sports and arts. Yes, there will be children from a more diverse range of backgrounds. But if we're to go on Ofsted judgments on school quality and Fraser's vaunting of the changes of the last 14 years, most parents in most parts of the country will access a good to outstanding state school, and they will, according to Sam Friedman, former advisor to Michael Gove, find teaching that is as good as any you will find in the private sector. And, you know, it's really odd to read, as I did when watching a Commons debate on this issue last week, or to see, to hear, Tory MP after Tory MP bemoaning the tragedy of so many children possibly having to move from independent schools to state schools, but a state sector that they themselves routinely claim to be better than ever. If it's better than ever, surely they should be welcoming children into it. I'll be honest, I have my own criticisms of state education. I think it's too narrow. I don't think it's got enough creative and stimulating opportunities. I think educators should be given much more freedom, and I'd like to see a reformed assessment system. But the hard truth remains that if you are from a middle class or a hardworking or an aspirational family, all these terms are interchangeable, especially if you have sufficient surplus income, your child will do very well indeed. And it is true the privately educated are becoming less and less advantaged in terms of university entrance, and that's a good thing, I would say. Um, a final thing, I do think 
that there is a difference between the kind of person and the kind of citizen that your child is likely to grow up to be in the two sectors. To spend your formative years with only a narrow, largely wealthy cross section of society is likely to have a lasting impact, not just on your perception, but possibly your lack of perception about yourself and your fellow citizens. Employers increasingly talk about needing employees who can demonstrate connection and empathy to people from all walks of life. And I appreciate that many private schools try to teach their pupils proper humility towards the less fortunate. But I would argue there is a world of difference between doing some occasional work like that and developing a grounded understanding of the complex circumstances of others from very different backgrounds. Finally, let me return to the VAT controversy, and he hasn't tinkled me yet, so I have got one more minute. Fine, it, you're fine. What? You're fine. you're fine. I'm fine, good. I think it's extraordinary the degree of protest that's been put up against this plan. It's a cry that's been taken up, and this doesn't really help the case of those who, who are against the VAT rise, by those like Suella Braverman, who, deploying her usual moderate rhetoric, last week called the plan a viciously cynical ploy to allow Labour to masquerade as class warriors. She called it divisive, which is really quite an extraordinary thing coming from her. <laughs> I read almost daily in our writer centre newspapers of how the VAT ri rise risks bringing single-sex education to its knees, pushing the disadvantage out of grammars, where I can tell you there are very few of them in grammars anyway. However, polling consistently shows, and Fraser refers to this, it is popular. It's supported, the VAT move is supported by every demographic group, except those who went to private school or sent their children to one. So I don't expect to win tonight. But even here, 43% of private school alumni strongly or tend to support the plan. Now, is that guilt or is that sensibleness, if that's the right word. To me, the great noise over the VAT plan shows up yet again how the influential in our society, most of whom are privately educated, continually direct our attention to what they think matters and not the issues that affect the majority. I said at the beginning it's only a small policy shift. It will change very little if it's not accompanied by a vision for greater economic equality and some long-term plan for education, ensuring that every child has what the privately educated have. I'll be frank with you and say eventually I'd like to see a single system for all our children. I'd like to see Eton College and Anthony's old school Wellington College turned into first-rate sixth-form colleges. I'd like to see the children of the rich and the royal family go to their local schools schools as they do in European countries. We're a long way from that, but we edge forward with initiatives like the pupil premium, reform of university admissions, contextual recruitment, removing the tax privileges from private education and raising a small but significant sum for the classrooms of the 93% is, I believe, one further very small step in one very long but important journey. Thank you. Yeah, that again. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Melissa. And our third speaker tonight is going to be arguing in favour. And can I please ask the two remaining speakers to try and keep under uh, the time? Uh, because there will be less time for questions. Helen Pike is uh, Master of Magdalen College School, Oxford. She's the Independent Schools Council representative on UCAS, sits on the Sutton Trust Advisory Board. Uh, his, it's opening a school in Uganda. She's a school governor, a trustee uh, of that school in Uganda. And she is a well-known writer, including uh, the sensational uh, book, Harlot's Press. Can the author of Harlot's Press now please tell us why you're in favor of this motion? And hello, um, thank you for being here. Thank you to Intelligence Squared for inviting me. No thanks to Anthony for that introduction. Um, I am neither influential and I'm not privately educated. And I'd like to start by saying that I too would welcome an end to fee paying schools for a whole host of reasons. And not only because it means that we could all swerve a discussion about VAT. During the past year, I've learned more about the wild west of this regressive tax than I could ever have imagined. 
And it seems that VAT only captures the national imagination when it comes to Jaffa cakes and private education. Both are national treasures which defy simple categorization. Fortunately for McVitie's, the Jaffa cake did not find itself on the front line of the culture wars. Unfortunately for fee-paying, tax-paying, independent school parents, private education is in that firing line. And we need to ask ourselves why this is, and why we're having a debate about something which is more a headline than it is a policy at this point. And there are two related issues which are lurking here. So like Melissa, I'm going to go wide. One is why neither the government nor the opposition is willing or able to level with the electorate about what the public services we really want actually cost. Instead, they resort to indirect taxation, which by its nature hits those hardest who are least able to afford it. The other debate is about why we are so conflicted about selection and parental choice. Both of these play into the plan to levy VAT on independent schools. And as Fraser and Melissa have shown us, this debate isn't really about VAT alone. It's about whether private schools ought to exist at all. And that's the lurking agenda, which explains some of the inconsistencies and sleights of hand that characterise the arguments for the imposition of VAT. So in common with you, with many of you who've already to detonate, voted to detonate my side of this debate, I would actually rather not live in a society where there's a yawning gulf between the funding that is spent on different children, a gulf based overwhelmingly on postcode. Will levying VAT on independent school fees fix the pupil postcode lottery? Of course it won't. Where you buy a house can be the golden ticket, with some schools having the ultimate privilege, the catchment area of a few leafy streets around an excellent comprehensive or grammar school. It's hardly a mixed neighbourhood. By contrast, Magdalen College School, or MCS, has some kids travelling from all walks of life for over an hour to get to school, if that's what their parents choose to do. They're almost always passing a state secondary on the way, and they're making what is often a difficult choice for rational reasons. These people aren't snobs. They've told me that they're making a choice that would be rendered irrelevant by the existence of a remotely comparable state-funded education, which met the needs of their child. I want to go back to GCSE Results Day 2021 and a tale of three pupils, two of whom were at MCS. One went on to be our head boy. He was on a transformational bursary and he's now reading medicine at Cambridge. His brother has complex needs and is in a different specialist school. The second of our pupils was leaving us. He's been signed with a professional football club since he was 14, and he was mentioned on Match of the Day a few weeks ago, making his debut for West Brom. Now, what interests me here is that nationally, we have a big problem with only one of those three forms of schooling. There are few things more selective than professional sport, but it's far more socially acceptable to get paid to be a footballer as a sixth former than it is for your parents to pay for you to do your A-levels. And to add to the national doublethink, we're fine with paying fees for selective universities and even with selective state sixth form colleges, which Wellington and Eton are about to become. It's also socially acceptable and increasingly necessary to pay for education if your child has special needs. We know this because Keir Starmer has already announced that those with a statement will be exempted from VAT. Good luck getting a statement of those needs, by the way, given the austerity measures which have hit social services. And the reason why those with special needs are coming to independent schools, and they account for a fifth of the pupils in our sector, is the same reason why many of those who are severely able to do so, their needs are not being met by the mainstream. And state funding is part of the problem here. When we ask parents why they choose us, the single biggest reason they give is inspiring teaching and securing those inspiring teachers with relevant degrees in their subjects costs money. The state sector crisis in teacher recruitment and retention can only be solved by serious money, and VAT on a majority of schools is not going to fix it. And it is the case that private school fees were effectively double state school spending levels in the decade between uh, 2009 to 2020. 
and it sounds damning. And yes, Melissa's right that there has been inflation of fees since 2003. But since no one, to my knowledge, has been in our schools for 21 years, it's difficult to tell whether they've been forced out by that or not. Also, having been in senior leadership in three different independent schools during those 10 years, I can tell you that those fee increases were not driven by a desire to gold plate the swimming pool, because none of those schools has one. The major outgoing is staff costs and the combination of rising wages and the accompanying teaching, teachers' pension increases during those years accounts for more than two-thirds of those schools' spending. As Fraser has noted, most independent schools are small and therefore vulnerable, and they're not the cliché. Last summer, the NFER reported that state sector teacher salaries would need to rise by 16.5% in order for real wages to make good the pay lag, which is now 10 years old in state schools. And the cost of that pay rise alone, if it were to be implemented next year, more than $4 billion. The very optimistic $1.5 billion forecast revenue from VAT is a punitive drop in the ocean. Nearly $60 billion is planned to be spent on state schools next year alone, of which VAT is not going to be transformative. Now, Fraser's outlined the strength of our partnerships, and Melissa has pointed out that they're never going to be enough. And actually, on one level, she's right. Without a return to the direct grant system, it's impossible for all but the very wealthiest schools to become needs blind in the way we'd like. MCS is one of the schools that signed up to the Sutton Trust pilot to reintroduce state funding for pupils at independent school and erode that independence. A return to such an enlightened policy would make the levying of VAT an even bigger nonsense. So let's have an end to this politics of division by school type. It's out of date and it's not serving as well. And levying VAT might be popular in the polls, depending on how the question is asked. But depriving parents of choice doesn't actually poll so well. And VAT is going to deprive parents of choice in two ways. Despite what the IFS or Melissa or Kia tells you, schools will close. And they won't always magically be in the right areas, meaning that pupils might not find themselves with a surplus state school place going begging in a school they want nearby. And particularly not in sixth form, where independent pupils form 17% of that age group and not the off-quoted 7%. And I know it's fashionable to be sneery about the sharp-elbowed middle classes who were privileged enough to be able to pay those fees, along with the bulk of the tax burden. But you know what? It's also quite confusing to be those parents. Many of them grew up in the 90s, when John Major wanted everyone to be middle class. And then Tony Blair came along and wanted 50% of us to go to universities. And then both sides of the political divide seem to buy into the old Fabian ideal that growth improvement and social advancement were fine, even if it meant leaving your station. And now we're being told that in order to expiate that social guilt of paying for your children's education twice through direct taxation and fees, independent parents are also to pay an, in an indirect tax too. Yes, they're above average earners. But why do we have those people in our sights? And our opponents argue for diversity, but they seem to think that they can achieve diversity by making schools all the same, this single system. So I might not be a supporter of VAT, but I'm very much in the value-added business. I know why I get out of bed in the morning, and I see the positive difference that my school and over a thousand others make not only to their own pupils, but also to our communities. So please, instead of a punitive, regressive tax on choice and on a sector which is world-leading, I'd like our opponents to examine why hard-working parents really choose to pay for independent schooling and face up to the real questions about how we address that, because levying VAT is not the answer. Thank you. I think you want to move over. Sorry? I think you want to move over. Yeah, right. uh, thank you, Helen, very much. And our final speaker making the case against the motion, VAT should not be charged on private school fees, is Ash Sarkar, writer, journalist, broadcaster, 
senior editor at Navara Media, which is a left-leaning online news outlet, as you all know. Her work there focuses on race, on gender, on class, and power. And in addition to a very rich life, she is also a Spurs supporter. <laughs> and her favourite player our favourite players are Sun and Vicario. And after an extensive bit of research, I can find absolutely no evidence that either Sun or Vicario attended any single school at all, <laughs> independent or state. <laughs> Ash, what are you going to tell us? Well, thank you so much for having me, and it is a pleasure to be amongst you all tonight. I stand before you a proud product of the state education system, but please don't hold that against it. Over the course of the evening, I hope to persuade you that not only do private schools dodge their social responsibility through their VAC exemption and charitable status, and let's be honest, the whole charitable status thing is a con, because providing the children of people who can afford tens of thousands of pounds a year and an inflated chance of going to Oxford is not a charitable endeavour. I think we can all agree on that. But as well as finicking over tax status, I really do hope to persuade you tonight that private schools as a whole are corrosive to our society. And they're corrosive to our society because they rob other kids, working class kids, middle income kids of opportunity. They're corrosive because they segregate children on the basis of class. And because the wealthy have the option of going private, Private schools have facilitated the 14-year-long austerity experiment which has systematically underfunded the education of the 93% of British children who attend state schools, who don't go to independent schools. So quickly, show of hands, who here believes in the principle of meritocracy? Who thinks that one's talents should dictate how far you go in life? Great, you're all on my side. <laughs> Because private schools don't operate on the basis of meritocracy, they operate on the basis of money. It is money and not merit that determines how far you go. There is a quid pro quo. If you hand over the equivalent of half the nation's average wage every year at a minimum, if you hand that sum over on fees, your child has an increased chance of ending up as a part of other elite institutions. And to be fair, the numbers, as Fraser reminded us, do back it up. 7% of the UK population attends private school for secondary education, and yet these pupils end up having a stranglehold on British public life. They produce 74% of senior judges, 59% of permanent secretaries in the civil service. They produce 54% of top journalists, and to date, 85% of British prime ministers. And I don't think that anyone would look at media or politics and thinks, yeah, we're really getting the best and brightest. <laughs> There's no justifying these figures on the basis of talent, but what they show is that through networks, cultural capital, and actual capital, a handful of institutions produce the class of people who dictate the terms of public life. But it's not only the fact that we are governed by a class of posh mediocrities that should upset you. It's also that it takes away opportunities from poorer kids. Because again, that 7% of privately educated pupils, they make up over 30% of Oxford places, more than 60% of places at the Royal College of Music, nearly 70% of places at the Courtauld Institute of Art. And so what does that mean? It means that 7% of the most financially privileged pupils in the country get an unfair bite at the apple. And 93% of pupils are left scrabbling for just 30% of the spots at some of the country's top institutions. So don't tell me that private schools open up opportunities for working class kids because the numbers don't lie. Whatever crumbs, and they are crumbs, which get offered through scholarships or bursaries or that nice day once a year where you can go and look at the grounds that you can't attend, those crumbs are vastly outweighed by the opportunities that private schools block at the societal level. Now, I want to talk about class segregation. And I do believe that segregation is the correct word. Because if we were having a debate about schools which were segregated on the basis of race, but don't worry, 
10% of the places, or maybe even 20% of the places, are theoretically available to black and Asian school children, we wouldn't be defending that. We would rightly be outraged. We would say that is deeply unfair. You are encoding an unfair practice at the heart of your institution. But here we are debating whether or not it's right to segregate the best resourced and most well-networked schools in our society on the basis of class. And honestly, that makes me despair. As mentioned earlier, I went to a comprehensive girls' school in North London for secondary, and it was truly diverse. Doesn't mean it was always easy, but it did mean that it was never dull. The pupil intake, it ranged from girls who were solidly middle class to girls whose parents were mechanics to girls who were in and out of the care system, girls who were refugees. And I will never ever forget the time when in year seven, I made a friend and I brought her back for tea and it turned out that my mom was her social worker. And I'm sure that for many parents, that would fill you with dread and terror. The idea that you're sending your kid to attend a school and other children may have come from literal war zones, both at home and abroad. But retaining a system of social apartheid where kids from disadvantaged backgrounds don't get to breathe the same rarefied air as kids from more privileged ones, that is the thing that I find terrifying. Because what I learned is that kids from those tougher backgrounds, they have so much to give. Because I learned a lot about life every day. And I learned a lot about life from the girl who had come from Somaliland and she was having to learn English both the Queen's English that she learnt in her English lessons and the North London kind, which we were teaching her in the playground. And we know from study after study that socio-economically integrated schools produce better results for disadvantaged pupils. And I think it's good. I think it's an inherently good thing when people from challenging backgrounds aren't abandoned by those with, from more stable or more affluent upbringings. Because what kind of message do you think it sends when you say that those kids, I mean, also kids like me, were simply too dangerous, too rambunctious, and too poor to share a classroom with? But in addition to that, I think that diverse state schools, they produce better learning environments than, socially, than the socially impoverished experience at fee-paying schools. I think that you learn more about the world, you learn more about yourself, you learn more about the people that you are, I think, privileged to share a country with. And I don't think it's right that for many amongst those 74% of privately educated judges, maybe the first time they encounter someone who went through the care system is when they're sentencing them. When Nikki Morgan became Education Secretary in 2014, not one single minister in her department had attended a state school. And that same year, the Department of Education proposed a 200 million pound cut to local councils' education funding. And between 2010 and 2021, per pupil, state, per pupil funding for state schools was cut by 14 percentage points. And I don't think that those things exist separately from the private school system. I think it was made possible because of the private school system. Because you're not going to be punished by the voters you count on if they've got a safer option for their kids and they don't have to send their kids to the schools which have the crumbling concrete or are beset by strikes or have teacher retention problems. The existence of the private sector for wealthy parents means that governments can get away with murder in the state sector. And it's just so much easier to impose unjust sentences, write unjust stories and craft unjust legislation when you've had little contact with the people who'll be most affected by it. And look, here's the simple thing that I wanna say. If private schools didn't confer an unfair advantage, nobody would fucking pay for them. <laughs> the existence of private schools wages war on meritocracy because it tells kids that having money will get you further in life than having talent and that there's no need to understand the country even if you want to be part of the class who gets to run it. And I think that state schools at their very best can represent what the country can be in miniature. Socially mixed, a level playing field, a place where people from radically different backgrounds can learn from one another. And I think if we were serious about meritocracy, which you've all just told me you believe in, you would actually want to weaken the private school sector. You wouldn't let, want to let them get away with tax-exempt status. You wouldn't want to let them get away with presenting themselves as charities. And maybe you wouldn't want them to exist at all. 
But until that sweet day, where we no longer have fee-paying schools in this country, marring the principle of fairness that we should all live by, I'll settle for scrapping the VAT exemption. So please, I implore you to vote against this motion. Vote with your mind, vote with your heart, vote in favour of fairness, and vote against the VAT exemption for private schools. A strong, passionate speech there from Ash to conclude the four speeches. We're going to move on to the question and answer, but before we do that, I'm going to announce the result of the vote that you uh, voted on before the debate. And the result of that is that 15% of you were undecided, 29% of you disagreed, and 56% of you agreed with a motion that VAT should not be charged on private school fees. So that's the state at the moment, but already many of you may have been persuaded one way or the other by those very passionate speeches.